Welcome to Biblical Insights with David Gooding, a Myrtlefield House podcast. When we study scripture, we ask two basic questions. What does it say? Why does it say it? What I'm doing, therefore, is looking for what I would call the thought flow. This is not just a philosophical theory. There's gospel actually works. Let me tell God what I think of God. Let God pay all so long as God be mine. It's no secret that Christians can sometimes find worship difficult. What does it mean? And what is the true purpose of worship? Is there a right way to do it? In this sixth episode, Dr. Gooding explains how true worship can prevent us from the harm of being fixated on our own failings by redirecting our attention to the person of Christ. Please join us as we come to listen to God's Word teach us what worship is and how to practice it so that we can be better prepared to offer ourselves to our Creator. God has given the sacrifice of Jesus Christ our Lord. It is not, of course, that we constantly have to repeat that sacrifice. For the New Testament is abundantly clear that whereas those Old Testament sacrifices were constantly repeated, the sacrifice of our Lord was offered once and for all. And since it brings to those who trust him complete and utter forgiveness, the New Testament informs us that there is no more offering for sin. And yet, as we come to the presence of God as his redeemed people, it is inevitable that the nearer we come to the presence of the Lord, the more we shall be made conscious of our sinfulness. That is incidentally why the exercise of worship is an exceedingly practical thing and promotes like nothing else the ongoing holiness of the believer. Stay at a distance from God, though you'll be surrounded by all his manifold gifts and are a little grateful for them. Yet if you stay at a distance from God, you will never become aware of your sinfulness like those become aware of it who constantly come near the divine presence. For the nearer we dwell with the Lord, the more will the light of his own presence convict and expose us of our inadequacy. It is therefore an important duty as well as benefit that constantly we come near to the Lord to worship him then being made conscious of our sin, as so we come, God uh, will point us once and again to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ our Lord that covers all our need as sinful people coming near to worship their God. And with relief, we turn from those many aspects of life in which we fail. With relief, we turn from those many features about our characters and personalities that are ill-adjusted and bad. With relief, we turn from them to the contemplation of Jesus Christ our Lord and his perfection. You see, the nearer I come to Christ, the more I shall appreciate my own shortcoming. But the more I appreciate my own shortcoming, the more I shall appreciate him. When I listen to a piece of music myself, yes, so long as it isn't too highbrow, I am uh, delighted therewith. But with that delight peculiar to an innocent who doesn't know much about the difficulty of actually playing the piece. But you who are experts that know how difficult such and such a phrase is to get your fingers round in the playing of that particular piece of music and how easily you could come unstuck and make a fool of yourself if you were trying to play it in public. When you hear a past master 
playing that particular piece of music and the way he makes even that difficult phrase seem as easy as easy could be. You are open-mouthed in your admiration because you saw the difficulty that I didn't. And only they who are trying to live a holy life will begin fully to appreciate the marvelous expertise of Jesus Christ our Lord. Going through life and its difficult patches in a way that somehow made it look easy. And our hearts are drawn out in admiration and worship of him. And therein lies another of God's practical secrets. Another reason that makes the worship of our Lord an exceedingly wholesome as well as practical thing. It happens to us all frequently to fall and to fail and to feel miserable with ourselves. Therefore, if we've any conscience left at all, being miserable with our own failures, we turn to confessing them and to complain unto humble confession before God. And that is good. But it can be taken to extremes. And our enemy, the devil himself, is not unaware of our efforts to be godly. And if he cannot trip us up by sheer worldliness and carelessness, then he will spoil us by pushing us over the edge of some extreme or other in our spiritual exercises. And he commonly does it with younger believers. They fall and fail, do we not all? And then they feel miserable about it. Some of us are a bit hard-skinned and don't feel as miserable as we should. But they feel miserable. And therefore they start to confess their sins before the Lord today and then tomorrow and then tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow until their exercises before God are one long concatenation of ugly things telling God at length how bad they are. And it leaves them in the end worse than when they were starting. For what you constantly think of, that you become like. Get obsessed with your faults and failings and you'll become very good at faults and failings. God's way is better. As we approach the divine presence, Aware of our faults and failures, God, so to speak, puts into our hands a great sacrifice for sin. And points us back to Jesus Christ, our Lord, himself all sinless, and says, God, please now, I've had enough of listening to all your badness. I knew it long since. Please change the tune. Don't go on forever talking to me about your ugliness. I know it and I don't like it. But talk to me about the excellence of Jesus Christ, your Lord. Have you not seen that where you failed, he was perfect? And do you not admire him for it? As we change the center of our preoccupation from our sinful selves to the perfect Christ, our hearts begin to respond in admiration to him. Presently, little by little, we find ourselves becoming more like the one we constantly think about and the one we admire. Not only did the Israelite offer these sacrifices when he came aware of his sinfulness, he offered sacrifices when he came to express his gratitude to God, when he came to bring his thanksgiving. God directed that he should offer such and such sacrifices. Gave the man something to do. It filled his hands. He had something to offer. So it is surely with us when we come in our holy exercises of thanksgivings and praises. One of the reasons why so many in public as in private are so slow 
at engaging in prayer and praise. Is that common human weakness that when we would give thanks, we don't know what to say? We'd love to praise the Lord and stand up in the middle of the congregation and praise him, but we, we don't know what to say. I'd like to tell the Lord how grateful I am, but I stutter and I stammer and I, I, I don't know what to say. And I feel a little bit odd, what? And something less than sincere. So I don't uh, do it. Hmm. If I might descend from high heights and come down to lowly matters, uh, it is the same sometimes, isn't it, when you get a Christmas present, sir? For this Christmas, I'm sure you'll get one, all wrapped up with blue ribbon from your wife, and uh, opening at her in your present, there is the till of tout from Boots. And of course now you've got to be grateful for it. You feel a little bit awkward, you, you don't know what to say. Oh, I am, uh, I am delighted, my dear. And of course, gentlemen of that order have means at their disposals uh, uh, that others haven't to express their gratitude. Bye. But what do you say? Oh, I'm glad. Doesn't sound too good. Well, I'm deeply grateful. Well, what else can you say? Well, I'll give you a hint, old chap, if you want something to say. Take the old talcum powder and start talking about that. Do you see? Look at what she's given you, man. The beautiful tin. The flowers on it. Open the old lid and sprinkle it. Oh, it smells delightful. Rub some on your hand and see how smooth it makes. Yes, talk about the gift. Then you'll have forgotten your own embarrassment. You'll find plenty to say. And as we come to God, and you don't know what to say, oh man, as it does embarrass you to get up and say, oh, I'm glad and I'm thankful, well, stop talking about yourself and your feelings and talk to God about the gift he's given you. It's the highest way you could possibly express your gratitude to God. It will, of course, demand that you know about the gift. But once more, as you get to know about the gift and you stop talking so much about you and your reactions and what you feel and put the greater emphasis on the magnificence of the gift, as you do so, God is beginning to correct that fatal flaw in our makeup that makes us self-centered even in our religious exercises. Whereas what we desperately need is to be taken out of ourself and our self-centered preoccupations. So that the locus, the focus of our thinking is not ourselves so much as Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank you for listening to Biblical Insights with David Gooding. If you're interested in more of Dr. Gooding's teachings, check out our other podcast series or visit our website, realfieldhouse.com, for free ebooks, sermons, and study notes.